So the first module in this lecture is about some basic um, backgrounder on oscillatory processes in EEG, where they show up, et cetera, and some examples of that. So here's a spectrogram of some EEG of a person. And what you see is, um, the first thing that you see is that there is some general fall off uh, to higher frequencies. Uh, low frequencies of high power, high frequency of lower power. That's called the 1 over f curve. Um, that's just the nature of the fact that higher frequencies sort of have more energy. And so for equal energy, you get lower power d uh, up there. But what sticks out is that there's some very, very prominent peaks, like this one here, at 10 hertz. And it's also very sharp. You see this, it goes from maybe 9 hertz to 12.5 or so. And then there's a little peak around 20 to 25. And down here, there's some other stuff. There's something maybe around 3 hertz in this particular recording and, uh, and other things. And so these rhythms, and in particular this uh, 10 hertz one, are the dominant cortical idle rhythms. So that's just uh, some large groups of neurons synchronizing their firing activity while they're not engaged. And uh, in, the, in the case of occipital cortex, we already said that's called alpha rhythm. Uh, 10 hertz approximately. It can be different for people. Um, some people have 11 or 12 hertz, some people have 8, 9 hertz, and so on. Or the motor cortex, some people also call it alpha, uh, and some people call it mu. And in motor cortex specifically, there's also beta uh, oscillations present for m many people, but not all people. So the exact frequencies are usually not known all that precisely, but we know the approximate range. And um, in some cases, some people don't express some things. But what's important is these things tell us something about what areas of the brain for a person are not engaged at a particular time. And so uh, you can conclude from that what is being engaged to some extent at a coarse scale. And so you can learn something about what the person is actually doing uh, in some way, uh, again, from a coarse grain perspective. And that is what what gives rise to BCIs that utilize this type of information. So in a short window, we're inspecting amplitudes of these rhythms and maybe their distribution in space and try to deduce for a single chunk of EG, um, say whether a person ha experiences high workload or something like that. And uh, people have proposed actually oscillatory measures for this based on alpha and, <coughs> and a few other frequencies. Um, However, our experiment, uh, our particular example is going to be slightly different. Um, this example is about motor cortex idle oscillations. And we're s I'll give you an experimental task that elicits these. The experimental task is as follows. You have one experiment. It's um, 160 trials. There's a pause in the middle. Uh, there's some data from this task uh, available. and. Uh, on, at the beginning of each trial, the person sees a letter. It's either an L or an R. And that stays there for three seconds. And this, the subject gets an instruction to imagine a left-hand movement or a right-hand movement, depending on whether he saw an L or an R. So he'll probably do a, a, approximately 80 uh, left-hand imagined movements and 80 right-hand imagined movements. And after that, you get some blank screen so the person can recover and, and prepare for the next trial. So the idea here is the person engages and disengages um, some neurons that represent the imagined movement. The same collections are also actually engaged and disengaged if you, in fact, move. But if you do, in fact, move, there's also lots of artifacts in your body that make it very hard to say whether the BCI that you used really used this, in, you know, the, the neural process as opposed to a muscular process. There is a reason why this is a... Uh, an example here, and that is this paradigm is actually um, one that can be used for people who are unable to move their muscles to train a BCI that can predict um, two possible outcomes based on what movement they imagine or, or kind of what, um, how is that called, phantom movement they are trying to execute. So this is a way to calibrate a um, a, a, you know, a BCI that can drive a prosthesis, for example, or a wheelchair. If we are looking at some actual recordings from this task, what we see is um, here's a time axis for three channels. And so time starts at zero, and it goes up to five seconds. 
So we have five second epochs that we're looking at. And here's frequency. It goes up, for, uh, actually down from 0 hertz to 100 hertz. And uh, the brightness uh, indicates the power of particular um, oscillations at this frequency, at this channel, at a particular time. So this is a time frequency plot. Black means very low power. And um, what we have here is over all three channels, there's something happening at around 10 hertz. OK, it's, it's actually pretty stationary, although the amplitude goes down a little bit in the middle. Um, and what's quite interesting is it goes down maybe a, about half a second in, which is the time that the person takes until it has, uh, he or she has really parsed the instruction and started to imagine the movement. And then they continue imagining this, and they end maybe three or four seconds later, based on how long they imagine this and so on. And so now this is actually an average of many trials. And secondly, these are not just the channel C3, which is here, and CZ, which is here, and C4, which is here, but it's the channel with the surrounding channel subtracted. So this is already spatially filtered using a surface Laplacian. That's why the contrast is relatively good. Good. Now, what do the colors mean? <laughs> That's actually interesting. We're actually showing um, the power in the, the conditions where the person is imagining the left-hand movement in red, and the power where the person is imagining the other type of movement, right hand, in green. And so over the middle electrode here, it's, it kind of tends to be yellow. So it's equal amounts of red and green. It's a bit more greenish, actually, some bias. But what's interesting here is over C3, one of the two colors, namely green, goes to 0, basically. So one of the, in one of the conditions, the, the power in 10 hertz breaks down. And so the idle rhythm breaks down. And that's because the person engages uh, you know, some tissue in their cortex to imagine this movement. And in the other condition, it stays. So that's why this is red. And it, it turns out that the nerves, as many people probably know, are actually cross-wired. So if I imagine this hand movement, the nerves actually cross over somewhere in my head. And neurons on this side are engaged. So if I imagine this hand movement, idle rhythms on that side break down. And uh, so in, in that case, um, uh, you know, over C4, the, the um, red, f you know, colored um, oscillation for that condition will, will go to 0, and only green is left. So this shows us approximately what frequency band and so on that one can really see something. Uh, there's an alternative visualization here, which is uh, much, much more processed. This is for every point in time frequency now going from, I think, 5 to 60, from 0 to 4 and a half seconds, what accuracy you can attain uh, if you try to predict what they imagine just from that patch in time frequency space. And chance love is 50%. And that's basically what we see everywhere where there's this blue part. So 50% is here. You see some fluctuations from you know, 45 to 55. That's actually the noise level. So um, that's just because it's a small number of samples, and so it's sort of noisy estimates. But what sticks out is that, again, in the 10 hertz band, you can get up to 75% correct uh, for very small chunks of, um, of data. You know, it's basically such a short window of data uh, in, in a ra rather short frequency band. And that informative oscillation stays on for, for the four seconds again. And there's actually also something else here, which is in, the, um, in a higher frequency band, around 20 beta frequency, which is also informative, though not quite as informative. So that's already quite interesting. In some subjects, we see actually that the beta rhythm changes frequency a little bit and so on. But uh, that's not universal. And some people don't have this at all. Some people just have the 10 hertz. So, that's the kind of process that we want to utilize. Actually, we also know that the sources uh, that are active here are basically pretty much the same. So it's a stationary oscillation for this whole period of time from here to here. It's not necessarily known in advance where it starts, where it ends. That depends on how long the person takes. And again, frequency is also not entirely known. So um, 
And there's a range of methods that are very good if you know the overall ranges of this. And in theory, you can kind of find them by parameter search. And that's some of the methods that we are going to discuss uh, in the next module.